Right, so uh, hi everyone, my name is Jack Snape, I'm Analysis Manager at Transport for the North. Um, so we are a sub-national transport body, it's a new type of organisation. Uh, we bring together all of the local authorities and um, transport planning executives um, across, uh, across the region, the North, from um, kind of Cheshire and Warrington in the South, all the way up to the Scottish border. Um, and um, obviously we've got a lot of different types of place uh, within uh, within the TFN area um, and I'm going to tell you a bit about the work we're doing on uh, decarbonisation pathways for the region. Um, so as part of our um, uh, our priority setting we've, we've done some work with our elected members um, so uh, to, to come up with four pillars for, for things that TFN is going to prioritise over the next few years um, and they're, they're shown here uh, on the screen. It's collectively known as the Northern Transport Charter. And what I'm going to focus on here is uh, the, main, the first pillar, which is champion, championing an inclusive and sustainable North. Um, so as part of that pillar, um, we've committed to set a decarbonisation pathway for the region, um, which is something that our elected members will, will sign up to. And um, we want that to be more ambitious than the national target of, of net zero by 2050 so we're looking at a, a zero emission transport system before 2050 uh, and precisely what that means is still being worked through but I'll, I'll come on to how we're going to decide that and over what time scale and um, so there are six key stages that we've been working on so initially uh, we've been assembling a greenhouse gas inventory uh, in line with the uh, UN uh, approach for how, how that's done at a national level um, to estimate our current emissions uh, within the region that we're going to look at reducing. Um, we've then been developing a series of baseline projections uh, for how emissions could evolve uh, in the future under some future travel scenarios. So it's very important to say that we're looking at um, the role that future uncertainty and demand and other factors could have uh, because you know the future future is clearly more uncertain now than it, than it ever has been and we need to make sure we can decarbonize regardless of what happens with the economy and and where people choose to live uh, and work in future and um, the third stage is setting of a target trajectory um so an overall annual emissions trajectory uh, leading to that zero emission system before 2050 and that's something we're looking to decide with our, with our elected board um, before the end of the calendar year, so in, in, in November is what, is what we're aiming for. And then we're going to develop a series of pathways, so um, an estimation of the policy gap between those baseline projections of emissions and, and the target trajectory that we need to get to, uh, which shows those strong and steady kind of reductions over time, um, and, and an assessment of the broad measures that are needed to close that gap, so to get from that baseline position um, to the target trajectory and after those pathways have been published uh, in November time we're going to be working on some policy analysis which will be a more detailed assessment of the policies needed to close that gap to get from a baseline to the target and, and as part of that we'll, we'll publish a decarbonisation strategy setting out how TFM will work with partners to roll out and promote the required policies to get to that target trajectory and that's going to be published in March uh, next year. So from a, a place-based perspective, the, the key aims of our work are really to help understand how transport emissions currently vary across different areas. Um, we want to explore how geographical and socio-economic characteristics um, affect the speed of decarbonisation in different scenarios, very much the sort of themes Greg drew out in his slides. Um, from that, we're looking to provide insight for policy development in different areas, so um, evidence base uh, that our partners and different local authorities can draw on and, and then also we can um, help to recommend policies to our, uh, our national part partners in DFT, Network Rail and Highways England and all of that will then help us to develop a regional decarbonisation strategy that's resilient to these potential different scenarios uh, and I'll come on to describe what the different scenarios look like um, later in the slides. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm an analyst. What I'm interested in is how we quantify these emissions and how we can look to reduce them over time by, by modelling, using computer models to, to estimate um, you know, what, what's needed across demand and um, emissions from vehicles. So, so this slide 
tries to break this down relatively simply. So emissions, calculating your emissions from transport is basically products of demand in, measured in vehicle kilometers multiplied by the emissions intensity, which is the CO2 per vehicle kilometer. And that gives you the total emissions. So there's lots of different factors that affect demand and emissions intensity. Uh, and we, we model these using our, um, our analytical framework. Um, so we've got a dynamic land use and transport model called NELAM, the Northern Economy and Land Use Model. And we've got a, a new model that we've been developing, which simulates um, the fleet of vehicles in the region uh, called No Carb, Northern Carbon Emissions Model. Uh, and collectively, they, they allow us to represent different outcomes for demand and emissions intensity. So we can look at uh, population and employment in terms of total scale, or where, where that's located in urban or rural areas. We can look at other socioeconomic factors, um, car ownership trends, digital communications effects, the amount of home working, all of those sorts of factors. And then we can look at transport system factors, so infrastructure pricing through, through uh, public transport subsidies and, and road pricing and fuel taxes and things like that. And then we can look at vehicle fleet policies, so we can we can look at the amount of um, subsidies for electric vehicles, the rate at which new vehicles come into the fleet and the, the rate at which old vehicles are scrapped and so on. And all of that allows us to simulate carbon emissions over time. Um, so that's a, that's a quick whistle stop tour through how we, we try to calculate emissions in the future. Um, we've, we've assembled a range of interesting data um, to, to, to help us with this. So the, the DFT, Department for Transport have kindly given us a vehicle licensing database for the north, uh, which is quite detailed and that allows us to see what types of vehicles are registered in different areas. Um, we've, we've got some speed emissions curves, which allow us to look at emissions by vehicle type uh, when they're traveling on different roads. Uh, we've got some automatic number plate recognition data, highly aggregated, but it's useful because it shows you how much diff different vehicles travel on different road types. And then we've also got some demand data, uh, which is based on our transport models, but, but also uses things like the National Trans sorry, the National Travel Survey and um, a range of other input data sets to estimate patterns of travel across the region. Um, so just to give you a flavour of the kind of data that we've got, um, I mentioned we have this vehicle licensing data. You can look at what types of cars are registered in different areas. Um, we can see interesting trends. For example, car ownership is lower in urban areas, um, particularly in the core, uh, core cities. Um, there are some interesting trends in car size. So we see larger cars being more popular in inland rural areas and smaller cars being more popular in coastal areas, but urban areas seem to have a, a mix of, of car sizes. Um, so when we pull all of that together, we've, we've been able to put together a, an emissions inventory estimate for um, for the north in 2018. And we estimate that um, 25 million tonnes of CO2 was emitted in the north uh, from the transport network in, uh, in 2018. That's just over 20% of the national transport total. Um, and we can also look at how that falls by um, origin zone. So we, we've got our model uh, zones shown across across the region here and the, the sort of trends you can see looking across cars as passenger transport and, and vans and HGVs to represent uh, the sort of movement of goods across the region. Cars generally what we see larger emissions um, in rural areas uh, and, and that's largely borne out through kind of longer trip lengths people making having to make longer trips to get around to work and, and, and to the shops and, and so on um, as well as having larger cars in some areas as well. Um, freight, um, the, the key thing to draw out with freight is, 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 is spikes in um, emissions around key logistics hubs. So we see the, the ports being big sources of emissions so around Humberside and around the Mersey uh, and also some of the, the big logistics centres around, around the motorways uh, that Greg referred to earlier. Um, so that's total emissions. We can also look at emissions intensity. Um, in terms of per head and um, per kilometre. And um, we see that urban areas generally have lower emissions intensities, and that's a, mainly a function of having kind of lower, lower car trips per head as a result of having better access to public transport and um, 
active travel options um, but there are some some effects due to the types of vehicles that people own as well um, so it's a mixture of demand side and kind of technology uh, vehicle ownership trends effects that, that, that cause this variation um, so, so that gives you a picture of our base year, the 2018 emissions, and I think Richard's going to show some more kind of detailed data on, on emissions uh, as they currently stand. But what we're interested in here is what happens in the future. So we want to, we want to take that base year position and look at what could change. Uh, so we, we look at the change in demand across the future travel scenarios. And, and these scenarios account for a wide range of factors that could change in the future. So we look at population, uh, and employment in, in absolute terms, but also the spatial distribution. Uh, and we thought this was this was important when we started this work kind of at the end of last year. Um, but obviously since COVID uh, and, and the, the huge changes that that's brought about, this spatial distribution question has become even more important. There appears to be an appetite for people to uh, leave cities, uh, home working, supporting that. And that has big implications for travel demand and uh, and it's something that we really need to play into our, uh, our treatment of uncertainty. Uh, obviously you mentioned home working and, the, and the, the potential for that to really take off. Um, clearly uh, there's the possibility for it to go back to more office-based work in the future but, but clearly some of it's going to stick and, and, the, and the extent to which that happens is really quite uncertain. Um, we're also representing other other technological trends. So things like connected and autonomous vehicles are obviously still uh, being considered and that could make tra travel by car um, much easier. Um, but there's also the pricing element to, to play in. So fiscal, uh, fiscal policy could respond to that and we could have systems of road pricing potentially brought in in the future if, uh, if, if, if there's felt to be a need to manage demand. And some of our scenarios factor in effects like road pricing. Um, I don't want to um, disrupt a, a big reveal, Jack, yeah. uh, particularly if, you, if you've got some uh, like early thoughts on the projections, just a couple of minutes though would be great. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. Um, so, and then finally uh, on this slide, uh, we talked about demand, but there's also the, the vehicle fleet side of things that we need to factor in. So, um, this is looking at subsidies for different vehicle types, the infrastructure that might be needed for, for refueling electric or hydrogen vehicles. That's uh, subject to uncertainty uh, because it's largely based on national policy rather than local and regional policy. Um, so we've developed four future travel scenarios. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't go into them in, in a huge amount of detail, but um, they represent a large amount of variation across um, urbanization, at absolute levels of population and employment growth, um, the level of technological uptake, um, the, uh, the amount of home working, and all of these things lead to quite different travel patterns, different amounts of active travel, bail travel, car travel, um, and different levels of vehicle, uh, electric vehicle uptake and hydrogen vehicle uptake, um, but, uh, and ultimately lead to, to different levels of carbon emissions uh, over time into the future. And what we are looking at in these four scenarios is how big the gap is between the kind of national ambition and, and what we might need to do at a local and regional level to get from the baseline position uh, to our target trajectory. Um, some of the key policy issues and insights that we're getting out of our analysis, um, the level of national ambition is key. Uh, but it's, it's an uncertainty until we have a, a firm national decarbonisation strategy, which we don't really have at the moment. Um, fiscal policy to influence the, uh, the fleet and shift travel behaviour are obviously very important. But it's, cl it's clear that local and regional policies can play a very important role. Um, we think from the modelling that higher levels, levels of population, employment and product, productivity growth can be consistent with our carbon reduction goals, but to achieve both policy measures need to be even more comprehensive and ambitious. So that's a, that's a challenge that we need to tackle head on. Um, and then the third point is, um, if there's a change in the way the population is redistributed, that creates new challenges that we're not fully set up to, to tackle, or at least changes the, the relative scale of different challenges. Um, so we, we need to look at um, different ways of decarbonising emissions in, in more rural and remote places where public transport is uh, less of an option in its current form 
Uh, we could obviously be looking at new new types of public transport like demand responsive transport that might be more suitable for rural environments. Um, so in terms of our, our work programme, um, we've just completed our baseline projections in September. We're going to be publishing those decarbonisation pathways uh, in November, which will show how we get to our target trajectory. And then we'll be publishing a more detailed decarbonisation strategy uh, in March. Um, sorry, I've overrun slightly, but uh, that's it for me. Thanks.